Welcome to episode 40 of Making It. I'm Bob Claggett. I'm here with Jimmy Duresta. Hello. And David Picciuto. Howdy. What's up, guys? You know, hanging out. Hanging out? Hanging out. You're not doing work? You're not making stuff? Oh, I'm making all kinds of stuff. I'm oh, yeah. I'm things, have, things have changed, Bob. Things awesome. have changed. <laughs> Haven't you been reading your tweets? I have. I have. I'm super excited that you've been making something because it looks really cool. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Let's get let's get to that. All right. So uh, I'm working on an outfeed table for my revised saw stop. They sent me some upgrades to it. And I think I talked about it before, but if you don't know about it, you'll see it all in a video coming out real soon. So I'm making a new outfit table. It's kind of fancy. It's got a big drawer and two cabinet doors, and it's got walnut trim. And uh, I went overboard with it. That's cool. <laughs> but it's cool. it's all made out of plywood except for the the trim. So that's good. It's an opportunity to to play when you do something like when you when we talk we jokingly talked about like doing shop furniture, but it's also a good opportunity to just experiment. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And new methods. I hate I hate watching shop furniture videos, and I'm not really a big fan of making shop furniture videos. But um, I, you know, I'm, I'm filming it, of course, because w- why not? And um, mm-hmm. but I think it's gonna be I think it's gonna be pretty good. Well, and even though you may not like watching them, a lot of people really do. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's all out of plywood, so you can learn how to make legs out of plywood, nice, strong, sturdy legs, and so it'll be fun. Awesome. Right on. Um, I, I actually had a pretty productive weekend. I, I made two videos, which will be out this week. Uh, maybe by the time this airs, they'll be out uh, making, uh, I just, uh, talking about Saturday and Sunday, I made a video on each day, one for core and then one for make. I'm a little behind in my own videos. I have a couple of uh, half-baked videos on the computer, but um, I made this uh, really cool mallet, which I was excited about. It's It's been on Instagram a little bit. So I was, I was excited as it was coming out. So I was Instagramming it quite a bit. Uh, like an old school mallet with brass rings on the end. And it worked out good. I had this big, you'll see in the video, it's like a 10 foot, three inch diameter tube of brass that I I had to buy the whole tube. I only needed a couple feet of it to make a lamp a few years ago. And uh, so I was able to cut, I was able to use two more inches of it. (laughs) (laughs) it, In one of the photos, in one of the photos, it looks like it was chucked up in the lathe with the handle attached. I was wondering about that Oh yeah, that that confused everybody. I just did that just as a... Yeah, that's why I like you. (laughs) <laughs> Rough over on feathers. Uh, the handle, <laughs> the handle just uh, slots in from the top. You know, it's a typical mallet where uh, the handle is tapered, and then the, the head slides on the bottom of the handle, and then tapers up to the top. So I just was just test fitting it before I unchucked it. So that it's uh, it confused everybody. They're like, "How how are you making that? I don't get it." So I just <laughs> slid the handle. So in the video, you see me just slide it in, take a look at it, feel it, and then pop it back out, and then spin the lathe again. So. That was it. And, and then uh, and I'm up at the house right now as we speak. I came up here to do some yard work and working on the old truck. I put the new brakes in in the back, so uh, I'm figuring that out. I got basically a, a a couple of Ziploc bags of parts, which made no sense to me whatsoever. And I just <laughs> sat in the front of the wheel well with all the Ziploc bags of parts and a greasy iPhone. And I just kept like, <laughs> and the iPhone kept going to sleep, so I kept having to type my phone number into it, you know, my passcode. Oh, what a pain in the butt last night. It took me hours. I put it together like four or five different times, different ways, wrong, wrong, wrong. And then finally figured it all out. I watched my my friend Eric, the car guy, and a couple of other people and some photo reference, and I was able to get it right. Hmm. And so this morning I went out and I put the other one together in five minutes. Nice. But that's the main reason I'm doing this is just to learn all these stupid things that that I never confronted in my childhood. I would always like, when it got complicated, I just like send it to the garage and like you guys handle it. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so it's 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 you know the learning never stops. That's cool. So. Awesome. Well, I am painting some shelves, which is not terribly interesting, and I hate painting. <laughs> so there's that. <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm just trying to catch up on stuff. You know, the last couple of weeks have been like we talked about last week, just a lot of travel. This weekend, I was in uh, Atlanta for the uh, Maker Fair. How did that go? Was there a big turnout? There was a pretty big turnout. It was really rainy. Well, it was kind of rainy. It was. It looked like it was about to just dump water the entire time. And it rained a lot before, like the night before. But really throughout the two days of the fair, it was just kind of misting. It was really cloudy and stuff. But, you know, there was no hard rain or anything. So I think that kept a lot of people away because they expected it to be bad and kept some of the people who would have had booths there away because oh. they just didn't show up. So there were several empty spots where there should have been people 
But mm. I was actually surprised at how many people did show up and how many people were walking around. It was a lot bigger this year, spread over a larger area. And so, you know, it, it was it was busy and like I had lots of people come by my booth and so it was great to meet people and talk to people and stuff. And uh, my wife was up there helping me selling shirts and talking to people when I couldn't talk to them and all that. So it was a good time. Nice. Yeah, I saw a photo cool. of the booth that your I think your father posted on Facebook, and it looked pretty busy. Yeah, it was pretty consistently busy. I think a lot of that had to do with the arcade being there. Yeah, <laughs> you know, all the little seven and eight year old kids were like standing in line to play uh, Super Mario Brothers and stuff, and that was pretty funny. <laughs> and you know it, what you got to do? Uh, I, I saw one of your pictures where you, you correct me if I'm wrong. Was it your booth where you had like the the buckets full of water, yeah. holding it down? Yeah, you got to scrape off the you know let's make something and put on a vinyl sticker of I like to make stuff logo oh, right on that bucket. I probably should. Those were those were borrowed last minute because like our <laughs> tent was about to fly away. Because <laughs> so, that's your color. Yeah. yeah, totally is. But yeah, it was a good fare. And so now I'm just trying to get back into the swing of things. You know, my two weeks of traveling and stuff is over. So mm-hmm. I'm trying to get back on the horse of getting things made. How's your car running? I saw you put up the documentary, but I didn't watch it yet. The one uh, it's the running one. great. Yeah, it's running running really well. Yeah, so I put up that video today, and and it talks a little bit about the car, but it's mostly about um, the car was a gate was a gateway to a, a thought process I had about being unique or original, and like the difference between the two, and and how they, you know, they're both important in different ways, but they're not always both important. And so I talked about that, and I've gotten a really interesting response to this video. <laughs> it's been I don't want to I don't want to harp on it, and I don't really want to talk about the negative stuff. But there has been a fair amount of negativity towards it, um, which kind of proves the point. Which is <laughs> really interesting, you know, um, when when you put out a piece of content to get people thinking, and their response to that content actually proves the point that you were trying to make is oh really <laughs> now i gotta go watch it <laughs> yeah let's, let's all take a five minute break yeah and come back. <laughs> it's it's not really that groundbreaking basically i got in trouble for driving while i was filming from a bunch of people that's one part of it but just the the response to me doing videos that are not um building. making things yeah they're just not building yeah. uh is is always kind of interesting but anyway Let's move yeah. on past that. I'm moving on. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I brought it up. No, 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 no. It's good. It's very. It's present. I'm still. I'm still bruised from some of the comments uh, today. It's tough. Yeah. Did you guys see the, some of the comments on the PSA video that David put up? No. Oh yeah, this is stupid. You know, just uh, because. Well, I guess it's directed at me mostly in April because we both sort of cussed a little bit, and so uh, there's a couple of people just like. Wow, you know, I sat here with my child, and you know, you guys said curse words, and uh, I wish I'd have known. Mm-hmm. And David, David defended. He goes, "Do you just let your kid cross the street without looking both ways?" Uh, <laughs> oh, wow, <laughs> David, David gets very honorary when when people pick on him. He goes crazy. Oh, I, I, I've, I just, I've seen I that in the comments. Yeah, and on, on other did, videos, I did not chime in at all. I stayed completely out of it. <laughs> yeah. And I even said, "I go, did I curse?" He goes, "Yeah, you cursed like six times." I go, "I did. I didn't even realize." <laughs> <laughs> but you know that's my New York uh, loud mouth I talk fast I start cursing I don't realize it <laughs> sorry I put these guys through hell they have to bleep me all the time <laughs> we love you <laughs> yeah Thank you. that's anyway. why I don't talk in my videos I just uh, I put my foot in my mouth well but see that I mean okay I didn't really want to do this but that's kind of <laughs> the point about the the video that I made is like being unique and being you know we do stuff differently and like we have different audiences and we have different intention and we have different background and like that stuff's all wrapped up in like who we are. The three of us are very different people and we have very, we're, we're a lot alike, but we're also a lot different and that's okay. You know? And no, that everybody got, that like got totally lost on mm-hmm. some of the commenters, but. Oh, I didn't even, I haven't noticed it. So I'd be curious to look, but you know, that was one of the good things about one of the, one of the, 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 the beautiful things about WIA is that there was like maybe 30 of us that all content creators and every one of us has our own style. Every one of us has our own personality and there's room for everybody. And that's what I thought was just so cool yeah. because, you know, any one of us at the WIA, you know, has something to say. And it's, it's really, it's like a beautiful new world because you think about the people that make it through to the television world. And, you know, of course, I have experience with that. But how many people can't make it through because of some personal preference that somebody in charge has to be in charge of? And so, you know, so many people are shielded from 
you know, the viewership. Well, even on top of that, for television, yeah. you have to change what you're doing to accommodate for like the lowest common denominator. So you're you're compromising. Absolutely. And on YouTube, I can do exactly okay. what I want to do. You can do exactly, exactly what you want to do. And that's why there are there were 20 people in the booth and t- with 20 different channels. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, like you said, and, and I think I said a couple weeks ago, and it doesn't really even need to be said, but it's just all honest, interesting content that we all make. There's no, you know, there's no, it's not like reality TV, which is, you know, in quotes, reality TV. <laughs> yeah. It is reality TV because we're, we're making things yeah. and we're showing techniques and inspiring people and, you know, and it's working and, you know, and we're, and we're, and we're having fun doing it. And that's what's good about it. It's, so it's the new world, and uh, actually on that subject, where you know the the topic for the day is, is how does becoming video creators or content creators how does it affect us individually as artists? And uh, it's it's changed my life literally in the last four years. Now every single thing I do, I I stop to think, what is the interesting technique in here that I could that I could highlight regardless of what it is, even if it's just like a repair in the house. But, you know, I try and frame everything. Like I think of my videos as like a, as kind of like a song. So I think of like a beginning, middle and end and like sort of like if it's not enough to get into it, I, I kind of, I, 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 I cheat myself because there's a lot of times where I think I, I should have made the video. And a lot of times I'm partway through it and I'm like, you know what, I'll make the video. Like the Sigmund sign. I already started it and David said, no video? And I was like, nah, this is so simple. And, you know, the video's got, you know, a lot, a lot of hits at this point. It's, it's, it's just straightforward bandsaw work and I thought it would be boring, but, you know, a lot of people like that from me. And so I have to keep reminding myself, uh, you know, so the simple stuff is also good content. But um, it's everything is potentially going to be a, a video and then that video becomes like a, a little piece of artwork that I'm, that I'm proud of. So, you know, as, how does it affect me as a content creator? Like, I feel like, uh, I'm a videographer, I'm a production company, all these things that I never <laughs> really was before. You know, like uh, Steve Ramsey said it, we're, we're production companies now. Mm-hmm. You know, he, I think he said that at WIA to one of us and, and it's true, you know, like when you, I, I posted a couple a year ago, I posted like a picture of my camera box and I said, there's my production company that replaces 40 people that worked on my TV show. <laughs> and uh, it's so true. It's like, it's so funny. I remember I laid down a credit card for a camera a couple, like 10 years ago, I say a couple, 10 years ago. And it was like all the money in the world, like four or five, forty five hundred dollars for a Sony DVX 100 with all accessories. And, you know, now the cameras that are better <laughs> quality than that are disposable. So it really doesn't it doesn't inhibit you as an artist having like access to these GoPros. I mean, obviously they're expensive, you know, in relative terms. But when you think of when I was a student in the in the eighties at SVA, all the students that had these creative, wonderful movie ideas, they spent about ninety percent of the time trying to figure out whether they were going to get the money to make mm. those ideas. Yeah, it's true. And now all that is just completely gone. Like there's like nothing between your idea and making it now. Yeah. Because almost every one of us can make the same movie on our iPhone. I mean, there's been some content creators on YouTube that still make movies on their iPhone, and I didn't even know it until they talked about it. Yeah. So I mean, it's just it's such a it's such an interesting new, creative, great world out there for for what we do and what everybody does. You know, I constantly remind my students: if you have a Mac laptop, you basically have a production company. You could publish books, make movies. And create desktop publishing, and there's nothing to stop you except for your own personal limitations. Yeah, somebody asked me the other day on Twitter, um, you know, what camera should I get? And I was like, it doesn't matter. Any modern camera is going to be just fine. Um, yeah. And then, and then I went on to say, like, also think about whatever camera you feel comfortable replacing that because you accidentally broke. Right? <laughs> yeah. Because eventually your dust is going to get into your camera or your camera is going to break. But um, everything you said was, was really well said. I was like, I don't know what I can add to that. But <laughs> um, being a content creator on YouTube and on my website actually makes me better at what I do. Because now yeah. I'm not just making stuff for myself, my wife, and the house. I'm making stuff for a whole bunch of people to watch. And that's really crazy inspiring. And it's i i it it changes what i make and that i want to make something maybe that's a little bit 
fancier, maybe push my limits because people mm -hmm. are watching my progress. And yeah. so I'm always trying to outdo myself and that just makes me better. And I want to thank KRT Wood for suggesting um, mm -hmm. this topic. Right, yeah. He puts out awesome videos and he, this was, this was his suggestion. So, you know, it's funny. I, I almost edited myself the other day. Like if you guys have seen the mallet that I was talking about is on Instagram, I, um, in the beginning of the day, Actually, a fan, uh, a fan of of mine, wrote me months ago and said, "You know, I love your mallet. Would you make me a mallet?" And I knew I wanted to make a mallet project, a different than the one I've done in the past. And then it, he reminded me again. So the one I made in the video, I'm going to keep just because it's part of the video series, and I'm kind of sentimental to that. But I'm going to make him the same one. He's uh, he's he said some really kind things, and I promised I'd make him one. And um, but uh, in the beginning of the day, I'm like. I, I made a mallet, you know, but then I really convinced myself that this is a completely different technique, completely different method. And so, you know what, there's going to be a completely, a, a completely different set of, you know, story to tell here, a different set of circumstances to tell. And, um, I was really happy I did. And, um, I was, it's a, I'm really proud of this little movie and uh, I did a voiceover version of it and a non voiceover version. And I let Matt make choose which one. So they'll probably put the make the voiceover version up. Hmm. Yeah, so I'm doing I'm doing a lot of movies and I'm going back and I'm doing voiceovers over a lot of my old movies for the book that we're working on at, at Make. Hmm. So uh, yeah, I'm just giving the background story behind them, kind of like the director's cut. And so the uh, my my partner on the book, John, he's he's writing based on the things I say, and then we interview and come up with some more fun stuff to say about it. Yeah, I'm kind of I'm kind of the same way with like you were talking about doing a mallet and then you've done it several different ways. If you look at my channel, you've seen. I don't know, at least three or four different types of shelves. <laughs> I've done a lot of shelves, right? And the ones I'm painting, <clears throat> excuse me, the ones I'm painting right now are actually another type. There's like a different mounting mechanism. There's a different look to them. They're open. There's, yeah, there's of, you know. so many ways to hang things. And so, you know, it's part of me is like, every time I do something like this, part of me is like, well, another set of shelves. But then I go, wait, well, somebody else maybe didn't want to put a French cleat up before. Maybe they didn't want to put a two by four in their wall for a thing, for a hidden, you know, for a floating shelf. This is an open shelf. There's something different about, potentially different about each different one that you do, even though they're similar, um, that can, you know, give somebody a, a little tip that maybe, maybe that tip is the only thing they pull out of that particular video or whatever. But mm -hmm. um, I do that all the time. I'll watch yeah. videos. I'm like, oh yeah, I know how to make this. But then I find that one little tip that I keep in my back pocket. Right. Oh, for sure. I mean, that's, that's what YouTube's all about now. Yeah. So I had a few thoughts on this. Like, one of the big things for me that has changed um, now that I'm you know, creating the content around the projects is the focus on process more than the product or, or along with the product. Mm -hmm. So if I was just making something for a friend and that was it, they only see the end product, right? So I want to make sure that anything that's ugly is hidden anything that was just a bad idea is hidden stuff like that you know so when i deliver it to them they go oh wow this is really cool and i'm like okay don't turn it over and look at the bottom of it that, you know? <laughs> um so but now you have to show you don't have to i sh i choose to show all that stuff and so that gives me in a, for better or for worse gives me uh focus on on making sure that the process makes the most sense and like is not going to be obvious in the end that like, wow, you made a bunch of dumb decisions over and over and over throughout this build, but in the end it turned out okay. That still happens to me. But Yeah, for I, sure. But I'm still I'm I'm a lot more aware of what the process like how the process is presented rather than just the process. Well, you know, it's definitely true when you're working in your shop and then like when you're working alone, you cut lots of corners and you're like, you know what? This, that, or the other things. Yeah, let me just go with this type of joint. <laughs> mm -hmm. But then when the when the world is watching, you really have to be on your game. And, and if you're going to make a wacky decision, you better have some good backup for it. Well, you, and that kind of, go ahead, David. I was just going to say, do you make thing. things more complicated for yourself because the camera's on? Uh, not necessarily, but you know, I definitely cut corners sometimes, you know, uh, when I make things for myself, especially mm -hmm. because I'm like, you know what? It doesn't matter if it breaks, I'll fix it again. <laughs> that's, that's, <laughs> that's the biggest problem. I, I, I mean, I did it with the ice picks. Every ice pick I've ever made, I've only ever soldered, which is soft solder. And then knowing that I was going to ship out a hundred that's going to be in the hands of everybody, I learned how to silver solder because that's the right way to do it. And the product will last longer. 
So, uh, you know, I cut corners when I'm alone and, you know, for, like I said, for my own stuff, it's just, it's just a sense of my own laziness. I do find myself trying to do the opposite of that on occasion. And it's something I, I'm trying to like fight against myself with like pocket holes. Perfect example. Pocket holes do a job, right? Some people love them. Some people hate them. Doesn't really matter. But when I go to put two things together and the simplest, fastest way to do it is a pocket hole, there's part of me because of where the content is going. There's part of me that rethinks that and says like, should I come up with a more elaborate, more fine in air quotes way to do it because this has already been done a lot by me or by other people. You know what I mean? So like mm-hmm. I, I do censor the quickest and easiest way, which is not bad. It's not like I'm doing like a cheating way. It's just like, do I want to give off the vibe that I do something finer than this? Or do I just want to do what I'm going to do? And so I want to be authentic in the thing. So I'm trying to just do the things that I want to do. But there is that part of me that's like, I really don't want to listen to people complain about pocket holes again. So should I just, <laughs> should I learn how to do this thing or this do thing? Let's do a Yeah. Just like, you know, do I make this take twice as long for the sake of not having to listen to this? But so that's part of it. And I think um, that kind of leads to one of the negative things about, for me personally, about creating content is I'm starting to get a little gun shy with comments and with, it's not really about comments. It's just about perception, getting a little gun shy with um, pre thinking what people are going to respond to, you know, good and bad and trying to iron that stuff out ahead of time. And there's no way you can do that. You can't fully get rid of all of the stuff like, you know, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to paint things in this way because super, painy guy is going to complain about it if I don't, you know, and yeah. I'm going to make sure that I connect things this way. So I, I found that it can actually be detrimental for me to try to solve all those things and, and just assume that I know what everybody's going to like or dislike ahead of time and try to like, you know, try to work around them before you actually do any work. So I am trying not to let that become a big thing, but I can see how as somebody who creates content and tries to avoid ruffling the feathers, like you said earlier, Jimmy, like and who's trying to avoid that. I can see how that could be a little debilitating to certain people of like, well, I just don't, I don't know all the ways I'm going to offend somebody. So I'm just not going to do anything, you know? <laughs> yeah. Right. I, have a, I, I think I have a video coming out that's going to offend people. And I, for some reason, another one, another one, another one. <laughs> another yeah, one. Right. And I, I, and I, I think I bet Jimmy and David does this too, but sometimes it's fun to ruffle the feathers and, and get people reacting. So when my, how to cook a steak like a like a Sasquatch video comes out. There's going to be some people that are not going to like that video, and that, for whatever reason, that just like oh, it makes me so excited to do more. I don't know what I just like getting a reaction. If I just get if I make a video and it's just like that's nice, that's that's not really a, a satisfying reaction. Yeah, I uh, I I made the draw knife a few weeks ago on for the Make Magazine channel, and. It, it came with the the tangs of the handle bent around the wood, and I unbent them, and then just glued the handles on. I, I talked about this, but I did that. It was a very conscious decision just to annoy the people that were <laughs> going to be. I did that hundred. I could have just easily bent them back and made it exactly the way I found it, but I glued them in, and it was a hundred percent just to annoy like you know the ten percent of the people that are going to like say that I'm a hack and all this other stuff. <laughs> and uh, like I said, I, I, I talked about this, but one of my, uh, you know, one of the people that's pro, pro Jimmy did the, did the math and said that the way I did it is, is probably uh, mathematically stronger than having the tangs bent over. Hmm. And uh, so nobody believes him, but I just said, <laughs> yeah, what he said. Thank you, brother. Thanks, man. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I, I certainly do things on a and everybody knows that about me. I do things specifically just to annoy people. It's, it's and, the, you know, and they're in the way, it sometimes looks like I'm taking the short way out or the, the shortcut. Yeah. For the well, record, I'm the, pro Jimmy. Thank you. <laughs> oh, yeah, me thank too. <laughs> so one of the other positive things that I've seen, oh, well, there's tons of positive things that have come out of, you know, uh, being being pushed to do better, being pushed in a, in a really positive way, being pushed to learn new things and try to figure out how, you know, the best way to do stuff, the safest way to do stuff. That's, those are all really good things that come out of, being, you know, f- forcing yourself to produce it and show it off. Those are kind of good reactions. One thing that I've really noticed about um, for me is that I'm a lot more aware of of opportunity for content than I used to be. 
now that I'm like, you know, I want to be able to show how easy it is to do certain things or to inspire people to do something more than they think they can. That has gotten me thinking about a lot of stuff that I would have just purchased before. And now I'm like, no, that I could actually make that. I mean, yeah, case in point, so like many things that I, that I, that I want to buy, but I know I have to make them. Well, see, I don't, I don't look at it as that I have to. I could easily buy something and no one would ever know the difference that I could have made it and I didn't make it. Um, but, you know, like this new Land Cruiser I got, it would. my first thought was, yes, I need a roof rack for it so I can carry lumber. I'm going to go buy a heavy-duty roof rack. And my buddy was like, no, man, you just started welding. Weld your own roof rack. And for some reason that didn't click with me, but now I'm like, oh, yeah, cool. That's like a whole new thing I get to learn and I get to share, share and... You know, so it's cool that um, I'm sorry. On a big and small level, I'm starting to find you know things that are opportunities for yep. me to both for me to produce content, which is you know good for business, but it's also for me to like a new skill. I get to learn a thing that you know is just a new thing that I'll get to carry into everything I do from now on. So uh, th- that reminds me of something. I never. I just thought of this term. I never ever thought of this at all. But it's actually the title of a good channel concept: urban homesteader. Because I think of myself as like, uh, I, because like you said, there's so many times where I'm like, I should just buy that. But if someone sees it in my video, they'll poo-poo me for not making it on camera. Mm. Like, uh, for instance, I have I did I started doing some blacksmithing last night just to kind of get my feet wet in my shop here in upstate, and my anvil's on the ground, so I'm like sitting on a milk crate, and you know, if anybody saw me doing that, it would be blasphemy, you know. Um, so I need an anvil thing. And I was in the blacksmithing place a few weeks ago up here. There's a really great shop. And he has a stand. And I'm like, oh, that's exactly what I need. But you know what? If I buy that stand, people are going to bag on me for not making one. And I should make one. And you know, it's definitely going to be a learning experience. So that's something that uh, one of the examples that just comes to mind is that you know, it's like urban homesteading. And then even though I'm in the city, there's like so many things that are around me that, that I want to replace and that I should just make. You know, like uh, talk about outfit table. Um, you know, I'm getting my new saw stop, and so there's going to be some accessories and stuff that I want to make for that too. I just wish I could just buy them, but I have to make them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I just speaking of tools, how does making videos affect what tools you buy? Because I've had this conversation with my buddy Jay Bates a couple times about the Festool Domino. Like, there's a, most of my viewers do not have that, so for a while I'm like, I don't. I'm not going to get it. And then I got one and I was like, oh my goodness, this changes everything. And I'm just going to use this now. And I've been using this Black & Decker drill. It actually died on me today. So I just ordered a Festool drill. I'm tired of crappy tools and I know I'm going to get some heat for it, but I'm going to be okay with that. I know that this tool will probably last me the rest of my life. So... I want to know how it affects your buying decisions. Well, for I me, buy whatever. <laughs> That's my answer. You're going to paint it white anyway. So <laughs> <not>. <laughs> I mean, yeah, for Bob. me, like it, it does, it does change. It doesn't change anything. It makes it's a consideration only because I know that those comments come in from people that are like, "Well, because I get this a lot. I know you guys do too. Yeah, if I had a hundred thousand dollars in tools, I could make that too." And I'm like. A hundred thousand dollars in tools? Like, what are you talking about? But there's a there's a big misconception about the cost of certain things when people don't have any experience, which is totally understandable. But um, I do try to just keep into consideration that like not everybody's going to have a CNC machine, right? So instead of me not getting one and not using it, I try to when I can point out ways that you could do it if you didn't have one. Hmm. Um. For the skateboard that I did recently, you absolutely do not need a CNC machine to do that. I did it because I had it, and it was an interesting problem to solve, an interesting thing to try. But I also tried to point out the fact that you need a rasp. You could do the same thing with a rasp, you know, yeah. in like 15 minutes. So and it actually would probably be faster to do by hand <laughs> than to do on the CNC machine. But that's not the point of it. The point was to, you know, try a new thing, try a new tool, experiment with something, and produce another, like a, a product out of that. And so, anyway, rather than not buying a tool, I think it can be equally as helpful. So it can be equally as helpful for us to have really lame, cheap tools to show everybody that you can do it with lame, cheap tools. It can be just as helpful to say, here's what I have and here's what I use. But if you want to take a little bit more time and not spend as much money, you can use a jigsaw. 
right? You can do the same thing as a bandsaw with a jigsaw. Yeah. Well, I, 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 when it comes to tools in my videos, I'm always looking for the most interesting thing that I could use. I mean, you know, something that I haven't used before. If I know I use this particular tool to do something, I'll try and figure out a different way to do it for another video. Um, but I, to me, I don't, you know, if it's expensive, cheap, I mean, most of the tools I have are used anyway. The only thing I have new is, is you know, a couple of DeWalt tools that I buy from Home Depot. But um, anything that I find that's vintage or cool or old looking or, or rusty or heavy metal, I, I love all that stuff. So I'm always obviously looking for that kind of vintage machinery and figure out ways of using it. I, I have to set up my 36 inch bandsaw, which has been in storage literally since I've been making videos. I used it on hammered and it's been in storage ever since. But now that I've come to the conclusion, I'm just setting tools up outside in my yard in the open air until I have a building. So I'm going to set that bandsaw up in my, uh, <laughs> what I'm calling my junkyard in the back. I went to a, a boat shop in Nantucket and they have the same bandsaw as me. They have it set up outside. Hmm. And it has a little roof over it. So they put a little oh, roof over the bed. So when I saw that, I'm like, I got to do that. <laughs> so it looks Jimmy, cool. Jimmy's place is going to be like the weirdest amusement park ever. <laughs> yeah. You just like go outside. And- <laughs> so I, I can't wait to get that set up. I mean, now that I have a trailer and stuff and I have means to move things heavy, um, I'm going to, it's one, it's on my list, short list of things to do in the next few months. But yeah. So how does uh, my, my tool choice affect? I'm constantly looking. As soon as I got the domino, I couldn't wait to use it. I mean, I think, you know, unusual tools and, you know, even if they're expensive or not, my domino, if people, it's funny to see the comments because people are like, why does he have a domino? He got it for free. He doesn't have any other fest tools. I can't believe you. <laughs> it was a gift from my girlfriend, Taylor, and she got it for me because she knew uh, Nick had one and Nick used it in the canoe video. And she saw me talking about it. And so she was was great and surprised me and bought me one. So that's why I have the Domino Festool. It's because it was, uh, is it the Festool? Is that what it's called? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Festool's the brand. See, I didn't even yeah. realize. Festool Domino Joiner. I bought that. I'm, I have that because my girlfriend bought it for me. Um, am I, I'm not so quick to run out and buy more Festool stuff. You know, if they want to give me stuff for free, I'll certainly take it. <laughs> but yeah, yeah most I, I of the wanna, stuff I buy, I just buy garage sales and stuff. I just want to say me too. In case yeah. they're listening. <laughs> I mean, well, and you know, that's a weird consideration that we shouldn't have to make, but you know, people often will think that the tools are the thing that make you creative or the that make you yeah. be able to produce a particular output. And that, that's not the case. I mean Honestly, yeah. I mean when I what the thought process behind me painting my tools white, I mean, of course, like I had like a little deal I once saw with the Walt and I didn't want to keep yellow in my videos if they weren't gonna, you know be my friend. But uh, the other thought process that was happening at the same exact time was I was getting annoyed by certain comments of like, oh, if I had this many tools or that's, you know, we all get those dumb comments. I wanted to kind of also make my tools generic in the way that like, you know, you go down the generic aisle in the supermarket and everything's white. So I wanted people to just basically say, this is a drill. This is a saw. It doesn't matter. There's no rhyme or reason to like the brand that it is. You know, I have really cheap tools that I still use all the time. Harbor Freight. I love Harbor Freight tools. You know, they're really inexpensive. You just yeah. got to be, you know, they have a time and place. So that was part of the reason behind painting my things, my my tools white. Yeah, my reaction to those comments of people saying, well, I can make that if I had those tools. tools. Like, well, just six years ago, I had nothing, no tools. And I started off with a miter saw. I just bought one tool at a time. And I, these weren't all given to me. So, yeah. you know, work your way up and... You'll get there. At the at the end of the day, every tool, if it's not a hand tool, you know, like a a hand tool chisel, it's either a chisel or something that spins with electric. It's everything. It's all the everything is. It's either a chisel yeah. or something that spins with electric, or a piece of steel to bang something into something else, and that's it. Those are the three basic tools. <laughs> hmm. It would be interesting to make like a a list of or like some sort of graph of those three categories and everything that would fit in oh, there. Yeah, a little flow Surely chart. Yeah. somebody out there in Twitter land can do that. That would be yeah. pretty cool to see. <laughs> it's either a sharp edge piece of metal, uh, a, a rock on a stick, or an electric <laughs> spinning motor. And that's all you have if you had a, you know, remember we did the stranded on an island thing? Yeah. That's all I would want. A rock on a stick, an electric spinning motor, and a sharp edge piece of metal. And then you could do everything in the mm. world. Once again, I'm thinking of the movie The Jerk, where he's like, all I want is this ash <laughs> That's <laughs> all I need. Yeah. Is this lamp. <laughs> <laughs> cool. No, like, there's so many times I'm walking down the street and you see like an electric motor like attached to something. And I think to myself, that motor has so much potential as all these different things because everything is mm. just run by a spinning motor. 
And I think, am I going to take the time with my leather man out and dismantle this whole refrigerator or whatever it is? <laughs> and then I go, nah, I'll just go to Tractor Supply and buy one off the shelf for $300. <laughs> <laughs> Well, what about actually, um, like visually, how you make things? Like the, you know, the get to the art end of that question. Yeah. Does, does it actually change like the, like the visual taste that you push into something you're making? Or absolutely, hundred percent for me, hundred oh. percent. I, I constantly, I when people walk in my shop and they see me, I just keep looking behind the camera. Then I rearrange the table and I look behind the camera and then I rearrange the table and I look behind it. And like, are you? Are you shooting right now? Can I talk? I'm like, you could talk. I'm not. I didn't hit start yet. And then all I'm doing is I'm rearranging the composition. So, whenever you see my camera, like most of the time when it's kind of a still tripod shot, I I strategically put things in the shot that I want people to notice. You know, whether it's an old project or you know, people notice it. I get comments like, oh, I saw this. I was able to pick that out. And I do that purposely just to just to give it some more flavor. So. What about the actual piece that you're working on? I mean, does it ever, does the fact that it's going to be presented on YouTube to a bunch of mm-hmm. people, does that change like how you make things look? Oh, for sure. I mean, that's mm-hmm. why I made the aluminum axes, just because they would look different than somebody else's axes. There's like so many axe nerds out there making wooden handled axes. You know, it could be anybody. It doesn't have to be, you know, this one, you know, it's Joe Smith, one, two, three, four, five, all making axe handles. I wanted to make one out of aluminum so that I would stand above the crowd or, you know, aside from the crowd. I'm not saying mine is the best. Mine is just different. And I just want people to notice that. So that's really a specific reason why I make things out of, you know, different metals and materials. I mean, the technique is the same, whether it's wood or this or that, but it's just the end result. Okay. It's not the most practical, you know, but then you talk about me and I win. So that's fine. (laughs) I think for me, it doesn't affect the actual look. Like, I am going to design this piece this way, no matter if it's on camera or not. Because I'm designing this piece for me. I'm not designing it for the audience. I'm filming it and teaching and inspiring towards the audience. But that piece is for me. Yeah, I, I would kind of think the same thing. I think maybe I I keep the construction into consideration, but not the overall look and feel of it, mm-hmm. you know? Um, I'm an egomaniac. I want mine to be like the one everybody wants to see. So, <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, I want I want them to be, to the things I make to stand out against similar things as well. Yeah, but I don't think I would like take into a, account that like because other people are going to see this, I'm going to use these particular woods or the you know this particular finish color or this style of you know like the mid century modern thing that you did, David. I thought it was really cool because there's nothing else. Like I don't, I have not seen many other videos done in that pieces done in that style in a video. Yeah, it was a beautiful piece. And I, I don't think you did that because you thought people wanted to see mid century modern. You did it because you like that style and you want that style in your house. And that's cool. I think the, you know, the tendency or the, I guess the bad tendency, potential tendency could be for someone to get like, all right, what styles are not being done in furniture right now on YouTube? (laughs) And I'll go mm-hmm. design a piece in that style and make it just, I don't know, that seems... I, I, that, I think that the person that tries to do that is not going to have as much fun because they're not making what's true to themselves, right? Yeah. They're trying to make something for numbers. And it's okay yeah. to make things for numbers of views sometimes, <laughs> but you, you'll find that the projects you love most are the ones that you make for yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no doubt. I'm also always looking for a transformation from the beginning, like from the raw materials to the finished result. Mm. So I'm always really looking. Like my my recent core video, I, I basically took a stump. I, I made a friend when we were in Kansas City, and I, I visited him on the last day when me and Dave were leaving town. And I took a stump from his driveway. And uh, so the stump was the, the I made a, a seat, a small stool. I haven't put any pictures up of it yet because I didn't get a chance to. But um, it started out as this like kind of rotten stump. And I was like, let me dig into this and see if there's any beauty behind these messy surface so i dug into it with a with a turbo plane and i made the the seat scalloped and and i started digging into it and it's beautifully spalted and it's got this beautiful texture and uh so the transformation of this like basically what looks like firewood to this kind of like gem like beautiful chunk of wood that i all i did was just reveal what was going on inside Hmm. and so i just basically made a simple three-legged stool for it to sit on and uh, so I'm always looking for that transformation. And in the beginning, I wasn't really sure where I, I, I was like, if this doesn't work out, I'm going to abandon this idea and go somewhere else. But 
uh, the, the the piece of wood looked beautiful. It looked like it was petrified wood. If you've ever seen petrified wood in the way like the, I guess it's calcium takes over the, the cells of the wood. That's what, that's what was in this. This was in the process of happening. Not hmm. petrified, but just the textures and the color. And uh, so that I'm always looking for that transformation, whether it's a pile of metal into some other object or, you know, a chunk of metal into something, you know, sexy. So that's, that's also a very big criteria. Yeah. Cool. Well, anybody else got anything about this topic we want to go over before we move on? No, it was a fun topic. I like that. I like, yeah, it made me no. think about it, you know, but one thing, I- one thing, uh, yeah, no, this was great. And one thing I wanted to remind, you know, and I do this as a teacher, it, the times have changed so much, so, so fast that, you know, people that are thinking about making content, the only thing stopping them is their inhibition. You know, in the past, the, what could have stopped you was finances and not having a camera and absolutely having no access to editing equipment or not knowing at all what to do. But now the only thing stopping anybody from creating content is just your own personal inhibitions because anybody can figure it out. Yeah. Mm. And that's it. I mean, that's the bottom line is that there's, you know, Casey Neistat says all the time, there's nobody between you and your audience now. Yeah. Nobody at all. And so, uh, you know, I'm a firm believer in that. And it's just amazing. The way because I personally know my my own story. In in the eighties, I wanted to be a filmmaker, and I just I saw other film students, and I was like, I can't, I, I I can't do that. I don't have any money at all to even buy a camera. And then as Final Cut Pro became available, and to where we are now, it's like completely changed, and it's made it completely accessible for me. Yeah. And uh, now there's there's at this point, if you're just starting, there's no inhibitions at all. And that spans and that spans across. That's way past video. Yeah, really good. Yeah. Good to point out to people, like like you said earlier, publishing, music production, r- just writing of you know like your thoughts, photography. photography. Yeah. yeah, I mean that goes really far. That yeah. same thing applies. Sorry I want to just point out real quick, not to bring up Kyle Toth every single week, but <laughs> up until a couple months ago, he shot and edited all his films on his phone. He didn't even have a laptop. Like, that was incredible to and, hear that. Yeah, and and. It just shows that you don't need all a bunch of fancy equipment to do this stuff. Yeah. You just need six hours to upload your video. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, right? <laughs> I noticed nobody else who's listening can see this, but I think we should take a picture of it. We talked in our signs episode a long time ago about, <laughs> about how Jimmy's dad used to make these whales with Duresta on it. And I can see over his camera, there's one of these <laughs> hanging above his door, and it's awesome. Yeah. I've been can staring you take a picture at the of entire that time. For yeah. the, uh, hey, hang on, I'll, I'll bring it up to the camera. You can take a snap of it. I think this is where my obsession with my name started because my dad made hundreds of these growing up. <laughs> it was like his way. It's like his, you know when you doodle. This is my dad's doodle. He would make a whale with our name on it. Always different styles. What does the whale represent? He just got into like nautical stuff growing up. I, I, I jokingly tell my brothers. I, me and my brothers had a really funny dinner one night. When we realized. I said, you know, it wasn't until I was like a senior in high school that I realized everybody's house was not like early American nautical theme. <laughs> Just my dad and all of his friends, every one of them had this early American nautical theme growing up. So every house I ever went into as a kid, it was like early American. Every piece of wood was beat up with a chain and stained brown. And like, you know, half wall, Wayne's coat wallpaper up with like drummer boys on it and stuff. And then like, as I started going to the friends' houses, as like I was getting older, I was dating girls, I'd go into the house and like, Wow, this house is just all sheetrock walls. There's no, there's no beat up wood anywhere. There's no colonial this or colonial that. There's no like wispy hints of George Washington. So growing up in the seventies, my dad's house and my dad and all his friends, you know, they're all makers themselves. They all did everything themselves. They just picked this colonial theme for everything. This like rustic hmm. colonial theme. So I, as all I knew until I was like seventeen years old. Hmm. Now, what, now let's talk about the capital R for a second. Is that the oh. proper way, or is that just to emphasize? The- uh, that's just that's uh, I, that's what I've been told. I guess so. <laughs> I, <don't know. laughs> I like it. I like it. Yeah, it's got style. Uh, I guess it means like from the resto is a town, and D means the the resto. I don't, supposedly. Oh, I'm right. a, I'm a really bad Italian. I'm from Long Island. I don't know much else. What's the matter, you are? <laughs> <laughs> I'm half Irish too, but we don't talk about that. <laughs> cool. Well, let's talk about what we're watching. All right. So I'm going to start off with, and I know Bob already picked this, but it is called Stuff You Should Know. Yeah, I'm cheating. But I got to see a live viewing of Stuff You Should Know. It's a podcast. It's just an audio podcast. But they release two episodes every week, and they just pick a topic, and they research the crap out of it, and then they present you what they found out. 
And um, so my wife is, a, I'm a fan, but my wife is a much, much bigger fan. And when they said they were doing live, a six day live tour, um, we had to go. And so we went to Detroit last night. We got to watch their live thing and it was, it was awesome. It was, it, the, the topic is supposed to be secret. So I, I won't, I won't tell what they did but basically they just had a live show and there was a little bit of audience participation involved it was really cool and i hope someday that we can be big enough where we do a live podcast because it looks so fun that would be cool it would be fun it's called stuff you should know yeah it's a it's an excellent podcast uh so um i'm gonna suggest a funny channel because i'm on it (laughs) (laughs) and it doesn't have very many viewers it has 31 subscribers I took this project, a, a, a local New Yorker found me online and came to me with a simple project. I actually made a video, but I haven't finished it yet. And uh, it's my friend, Alan, who's uh, creating a bicycle talk show. It's, uh, he's on a bicycle and he rides around and he will stop and interview people on the desk that's on the back of the bicycle, which I'm making. And so his, uh, his channel is Cyclepreneurs, C-Y-C-L-E-P-R-E-N-E. U R S cyclepreneurs. He's got 31 subscribers and it's the only reason I did it because there's some funny content with me and him. He keeps coming with these concepts to shoot these little scripts and they're only like 10, 30 seconds long. And, uh, we've been having a, a couple of laughs as we do them. And, uh, the most recent one went up yesterday and you can see this project I'm working on as we go. And David actually stood in for me one day. I wasn't around. So there's like a scene where I reach out of the hole and like yank something out of his hands, the, soft, the hole on the sidewalk. And it's not me. It's actually David. I wasn't there. And so they just improvised that it's supposed to be me. <laughs> and uh, so it's funny. It's Alan is his name and uh, cycle, Cyclepreneurs. So check it out. It's a couple little clips of us being stupid. Hmm. Awesome. Um, so mine is a channel that I'm just getting familiar with. I've seen a couple of his videos. And uh, he's tweeted some really nice things at me on Twitter. Um, and I don't actually don't even know his name. I should look that up. But the channel is called Artisma, Artismia? Artismia, yeah. Um, and Jimmy, I know you've seen it because you commented on one of his videos. He made the How to Sharpen a Pencil oh, yeah. video, which is oh, yeah, really very funny. Um, but he seems like he's really talented. The videos are, are well done. And um, yeah. so I'm, I'm interested in digging more because I've only seen a couple of them so far. So Well, that's the guy who had the show on, uh, on National Geographic, right? I don't know. Is he talks about how to sharpen a pencil, like an artisan? No, no, no. That's, that's David no. Reese. This is a different guy. Right. Oh, okay. Uh, You're talking about the guy that made the the skull, skull. ice pick. Yes. The skull. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. I love I love that guy. He's great. Yeah. So he, um, did you guys see the funny? Um, did you guys happen to see the funny thing he did? Dave and I were driving home, and we were in Kansas City. We found like a railroad yard with railroad wheels. Oh, where David picked the thing up. Yeah, and so I, I Snapchat and I was Snapchatting the whole ride home, and he took that little clip of us like pretending to pick up the the railroad wheels and made it into a a, a, a GIF or GIF. How do you say that? I'm yes. Like, say it. Say it <laughs> Either way. Either way, a Jiffy GIF. So <laughs> it's really funny. There's a lot of Photoshop in that little Jiffy GIF. He did a great job. <laughs> <laughs> I really hope that name takes off. <laughs> I do. Just say them both. Who cares? Jiffy GIF. Giffy GIF. <laughs> Cool. Um, yeah, well, uh, I guess that's probably it for us this week. I want to thank um, Luis Gonzalez and Jeremy White um, and everybody else at Patreon for help helping us keep the show going and for supporting us. Um, we're very grateful, and it means a lot. And so uh, if you guys want to help out the show, go to patreon.com slash making it and you know help us out there if you want. Or if you don't, then another way would be to just share the show around. You can go to iTunes and sure. leave us a comment and all that stuff or you could just tweet it and share it with your friends tell people you like it that's awesome as well so um, before we go where can we find everybody make something dot TV and it has everything 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 yeah. ever everything everything uh, Jimmy the rest of dot com <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy the rest of dot com Google YouTube Twitter. And I'll be at Pittsburgh Make a Fair this weekend, Saturday and Sunday. I'm going to do like a, an inventing oh, nice. sort of building workshop, and then I'm going to do a lecture. Nice. Cool. Yeah, it's going to be fun. Cool. Um, my stuff is at I like to make stuff.com as usual. Um, I am going to be in Greenville, South Carolina, doing a live chat on October 20th. It's a Tuesday. And I'm going to be looking for something to do that night. So if anybody listening is in that area and you know there's something awesome to do, 
let me know because I'm going to be stuck there overnight <laughs> with nothing to do <laughs> and I'll be lonely. So, yeah. Um, that's it for episode 40. I guess we're going to move on through the 40s next next week. So, that'll do it. See you guys wow. next time. Thank you all. Later. <laughs>